the Human Rights Foundation and sponsored by the John Templeton, John Templeton Foundation. Uh, the name of the panel is, as you've seen in your programs, from Che Guevara to Pinochet, eh, oh, Pinochet, eh, fighting Latin America's strongman legacy. Uh, brief introduction first, the Human Rights Foundation with the help of the John Templeton Foundation, specifically people like Roberta Hertzberg, and uh, Daniel Green, we have been able to carry out our research, and it's a long haul research, three to five, to five years, of official defamation laws and incitement laws around the world. I'm going to show you some of the preliminary findings about uh, official defamation laws in the Americas. For, for most of you that understand the, the, the value and importance of the U.S. Constitution, uh, you've all heard of the, of the New York Times v. Sullivan case that set up the standard that pretty much makes it impossible for public officials to sue for defamation in the U.S. against journalists or against public intellectuals that criticize the government. Uh, well, that's not the case in most countries in the Americas. Let me show you just this slide. Uh, this, this slide shows countries that, that criminalize defamation, uh, not necessarily of public, not specifically of public officials, but under which public officials can also sue, uh, sue, you know, journalists, public intellectuals that criticize the government. So from Canada, pretty much all the way to Chile, Argentina, to the Patagonia, all countries have these types of laws in their books. If you, as a journalist, write an op-ed piece critical of any public official, let, let alone the chief of state, uh, you you are subject to being sued on defamation charges. When we get to the to the part of Ecuador that Mauricio will present to us, you're going to see specific cases on which on which journalists get sued uh, by multi-million lawsuits on defamation charges, criminal defamation charges by the president himself. So. And not all countries, and to this I'm going to pass to give some framework to this, to this Congress, not all countries will use these laws, but all countries have these laws in their books, not all countries will use these laws. Typically it, typically it will be so-called authoritarian countries, whether it's fully authoritarian countries, namely dictators, dictatorships. In Latin America, the only uh, full-fledged dictatorship today, in terms of not allowing any sort of political competition, is Cuba. It has been for the past 57 years. The last dictatorship before Cuba were probably was the Pinochet dictatorship uh, that, that, that fell in 1989, and then there were a set of dictatorships that, as you know, have framed sort of the public intellectual debate still today at the Latin American Studies Department of all of, 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 of the entire United States. And it's this discourse of the left-wing, uh, full-fledged authoritar authoritarian like Fidel Castro, at some point Daniel Ortega in, in Nicaragua, and on the other side, the anti-communist dictatorships, uh, most, most represented uh, in the public imagery uh, by Pinochet. Others are Videla, others are Somoza, uh, and, 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 and Trujillo also uh, are some of the right-wing dictators. Those are authoritarian regimes, fully authoritarian regimes. We, the Human Rights Foundation, we do not focus on democracies or republics or you know liberal democracies. We focus on authoritarian regimes, whether full-fledged or these other type of authoritarian regime that professors Steve Levitsky from Harvard and Luke Wade from Tor Toronto University have described as competitive authoritarian regimes. Why competitive? Not because there is free market competition, but competitive because there is some degree of competition for power still. As opposed to, you know, Chile is Pinochet, uh, or is it Pinochet is Chile, or Fidel Castro is Cuba, where either in the case of Chile there were no elections for almost 20 years, or in the case of, of Cuba, where there are elections every four years, but the only candidates are the, the Communist Party, therefore it's a single party uh, dictatorship. Uh, it's a one party dictatorship, uh, apart from those cases, uh, those are fully authoritarian because of that, because it's, there's no competition for power. Whereas competitive authoritarian, you will see that the opposition is legal, therefore there are possibilities for certain gains of the opposition, as Venezuela showed recently by, by the, the, the opposition winning the, the election, the parliamentary elections. That does not mean, however, that this is a democracy. It's a form of non-democracy, it's a form of non-liberal democracy, it's a form of competitive authoritarianism. 
uh, according to, again, the book Competitive Authoritarianism by Luke and Wei and, and, and Steve Levitsky, which is the definition we follow. Therefore, we, fo we focus in Latin America on authoritarian and competitive authoritarian countries. The most, of course, the quintessential example of competitive authoritarianism in Latin America and maybe around the world, along with, with some countries like Kazakhstan or a number of former Soviet Union countries is Venezuela. Venezuela is the quintessential competitive authoritarian government and with less degree maybe of authoritarianism but still competitive authoritarian, still non-democratic you, you, you can see Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, uh, Nicaragua, uh, three countries that, that uh, in those countries you have no independent judiciary whatsoever, you have a government that uses, abuses power uh, systematically imprisons political opposition uh, members, shuts down the media, the, the big media criticizing the government in Venezuela you, you can't find anymore, you can't find big media criticizing the government in Venezuela, in Bolivia is the same case, just the biggest example of, of, I mean, of political corruption in, in Bolivia emerged a few, uh, uh, just a couple of months ago and led to Evo Morales losing the plebiscite for his re-re-re-election. And that, that was an example of how there is no big media anymore in, the, in, in Bolivia criticizing the government. This was something that was unearthed by a, by a second tier, you know, a, a journalist is a great journalist, but unfortunately he hasn't had access to national television for a while now. And that's because, again, uh, the government has systematically, as this common practice among competitive authoritarian regimes, restricted uh, uh, critical opinions in the, in the mainstream, in the mainstream of, of ideas. Uh, so that, those are some of the characteristics, uh, characteristics of fully authoritarian and competitive authoritarian regimes that we, the Human Rights Foundation, focuses on. Uh, and now I, I want to start introducing, we have representatives of these, the three types of regimes that we can find uh, from fully authoritarian regimes. Uh, Rosa Maria Payá, she is this, the daughter of a hero that is unfortunately very little known in, in, in uh, across the world and even in Latin America, I would say, the most in Latin America probably less known, who is Osvaldo Payá. Osvaldo Payá uh, was killed two, three years ago on, was, what, on what was likely a political assassination by the Cuban dictatorship. Uh, and uh, he was the most prominent, I would say, uh, the most prominent political figure in Latin America uh, for, in, the, in the second part of the 20th century, although he wasn't as well known. Why? Because he advocated in the most well thought, intelligent manner for the transition in Cuba to a liberal democracy. The way he did it is by using uh, the tools of the Cuban totalitarian constitution to try to call for a plebiscite uh, to, to lead to free elections in Cuba. Uh, he did that for over 20 years, uh, for over 15 years, eventually uh, they imprisoned all of the people in his campaign, 75 political prisoners in the so-called Cuban uh, Black Spring in 2003. They imprisoned everybody but Rosa, Maria, Rosa Maria's father, uh, and eventually they released everybody just a couple of years ago uh, with the help of the Spanish government, uh, with, the, with the help of Amnesty International, and they killed, after that, uh, Osvaldo, Osvaldo Payá. Uh, Rosa Maria Payá has taken on the fight and she has created her own wide campaign involving all parts of the opposition within Cuba, of the dissident community in Cuba, and it's called Cuba Decide, so she'll talk to, uh, to us today a little bit on that. Uh, then we also have representatives from competitive authoritarian regimes, uh, Mar Mar Mauricio Racón from Ecuador and Lilian Lucena from Venezuela. Uh, I already spoke a little bit about those regimes. Uh, Lilian is part of the student movement in Venezuela, particularly she is very active in the libertarian movement inside Venezuela. Some of you may, may know her already. Uh, welcome Lilian, thank you. Uh, and uh, Mauricio, uh, the work that Mauricio does in, in, in Ecuador is also very, very brave. Uh, Rafael Correa is probably uh, the most outspoken authoritarian right now in Latin America, well, after, after, of course, uh, Fidel Castro, Raul Castro, uh, uh, 
uh, Hugh, Hugo Chavez, and unfortunately the, link, the, the list is too long, but it's, it's, it's very well, he's very, he's very outspoken, and he has the problem of being a PhD, I mean, it's a problem in terms of public intellectual debate, because they, they come and tell you that, he, that he's a PhD, in, in, in economics in a U.S. university, which is a problem. It creates the, the notion that everything he says has some basis, so he may, may lack basic understanding of the price system, yet he gets a huge degree of, of, of uh, respect and deference just because he has a PhD on economics at a U.S. university. Um, and finally, we have Gloria, who is also a very prominent a public intellectual, as most, most people in this town. Uh, although she comes from a democracy that was able to, you know, associate freely, criticize, demonstrate strongly against the government, and instead of being called, called coup plotters, being imprisoned, as you, we, you see systematically in countries like Bolivia, Venezuela, uh, Ecuador, and instead of being incarcerated, this big movement of students and of public intellectuals, etc., uh, that led to a go the government's resignation, the president stepping down. So, and she was instrumental, I would say, the movement, the intellectual movement that, that she leads in Ecuador. That, uh, but sorry, but in Guatemala, exactly, and that has to do with the UFM. I have, I have a title of the Universidad Francisco Marroquín, great, great friend of freedom, over in Guatemala. She was educated there, a number of professors uh, in, at that university that, that, that are very clear about ideas of classical liberalism and that promote both political and economic freedom, and she has taken that debate to a different level. She's probably the most high-profile representative of the Universidad Francisco Marroquín through both uh, uh, her civic activism that she has carried out by uh, the group, is it Unión Cívica Nacional? Movimiento Cívico in, in Guatemala. So with that in brief introduction, I just want to, uh, without further ado, I want to I wanna pass it on to, to Rosa Maria Paya. They'll speak to us for five to seven minutes, all of them, and then we'll have uh, an open, first I may, may uh, make a question and then we'll have a Q&A from all of you so that you get to, to talk to the speakers. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. For me it's my pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for your interest in something that is has proved to be very dangerous for our whole region, which is the propagation of the authoritarian regimes, specifically in, uh, in Latin America, but I think that no democracy is safe right now because of all the efforts that countries like my country, or being more specifically, because of the efforts of regimes, of the regime that have been in power in Cuba for the last 57 years, are doing and have been doing during the last half a century in order to interfere in the internal policies of the other countries and in order also to propagate these non-so-democratic ideas. Cuba has lived nearly 60 years without freedom of expression, freedom of association, without real electoral process, and of course that all these are totalitarian tools that the regime use in order to remain in power and with, with all the resources and with all the money forever. But in the Cuban case, after 1959, after the revolutionary takeover, violent takeover, by the way, they introduced all these changes and they established a regime that is not just is not just a totalitarian regime in the social or economic uh, approach, but also uh, all these uh, political measures come together with a very powerful control mechanism in order to guarantee that the whole society is not going to have any more, any tool, or any way to go to an alternative model. That's why they also implement this big surveillance mechanism in order to each person in the society feel that there is someone else which is looking at what is going on 
in the neighborhood, in the neighborhood, what is going on in the school, what is going on in your job. But what is exactly to live? What do you feel when you live in a totalitarian regime? Well, everything. Everything is controlled by the state. And in the case of Cuba, it's controlled by the figure of Fidel Castro, or is sent to the uh, generosity of the leader, the generosity of Fidel Castro, now the generosity of Raul Castro. What does it mean that the school that you attend, the doctor or the hospital or <coughs> the place where you take your children when they are six, when they are six, or the job you have to go when you finish the university because in Cuba you cannot choose the job you are going to have when you finish your college or when you finish the university because as it was a gift from the government, as it was free, it was a gift from the state, you have to attend to the job that they are going to give you. If you don't do that, you just are not going to receive your title after two years of, uh, of working in that place. You could be called an illegal in your own country because you cannot live or you cannot move to a province different from the province you were born in because you just have no freedom of movement. The last free elections in Cuba happened in 1950. Since then, no one in Cuba has ever participated in free and pluralistic elections, which means that no one in Cuba, younger than 80 years old, has ever participate in free and pluralistic elections. Why? This is not a conscience. The only thing which is incompatible with a totalitarian regime is actually the people deciding. In, and why I dare to say the only thing after telling you all the things that a totalitarian regime actually suppress? Because now I'm sure you are familiar with the idea of the engagement between Cuba and the United States with the idea of the new foreign policy of the Obama administration and this perception that if suddenly capital starts to go in, in the island, well, Cubans are going to obtain the tool or they are going to wake up and, they, and a transition process is going to start. This hasn't happened and it's not going to happen because of the new engagement or any engagement because it's not the capital, the key in a totalitarian regime. And why not? Because each, each new change, each, each new reform is introduced as a new control mechanism. Why? Because it's not a recognition of the Cuban's human rights. It's another gift. For instance, right now there are more Cubans than, ca than can travel in and out of the country. But it's not your right to get out of your country or to get in. It's a permit that the Cuban government gives you. And your, to have a passport is not a right. It's not, it's not something that you pay for. It's a permission of the Cuban government and is conditioned to a series of requirements that at the end leave the capacity to decide if you travel or not in the power of the Cuban government. Same thing happens with the new business. In Cuba, we, we call the uh, entrepreneurs cuenta propistas because enterprise is like a taboo word in the island. So the cuenta propistas have not the right to have an enterprise. They have a license, a permit, and it's also conditioned to their submission to the government, to their, <coughs> sorry, to their obedience to the regime. So in the moment that a cuenta propista starts to, for instance, to support an idea as Cuba decide, an idea which is alternative to the ideas of the regime, he's going to lose his license because the, uh, the authorities could find 
cockroach in their in their kitchen, or because any other excuse, or directly because he's not obedient. So this difference is the one that makes that engagement or just capital or just put money in the hands of the Cuban government is not going to lead to a democratic transition. It's not going to lead to lead to a real transition process. That's why we are inviting you and uh, we are also engaged but, but in another direction, in the direction of the public participation. Why? Because a regime, as a Cuban regime, the only thing that have never, ever <coughs> done is to ask to the people, to ask to the citizenry what do they want, to make free and pluralistic elections, for instance. That's why we are involved in a campaign called Cuba Decide, or Cuba Decide, which is asking for a plebiscite in the island. Why for a plebiscite? In order to be the Cubans, the one who decide what is the system that they want to live in. What is the system that they want for them and for their children? And what is actually the question for, what is the future that they want for them and for their children? What is the way they want to live in? In order to do that, we know that we need a lot of internal mobilization to promote public participation, but also international commitment, international support, not with uh, the uh, right to have more, uh, more credit in the American banks for the Cuban government, but with the rights of the citizenry to decide their own future, which also involves the right of the citizenry to have credit in American banks, because right now Cubans cannot have that credit. Even if the Cuban government is allowed to have it, Cuban citizenry cannot have it because they have no legal personality. They have license from the government, not legal personality in order to have benefits from the engagement with the United States or with the rest of the world. That's why, that's why I'm inviting you to participate in this campaign and not just, and I want to, I'm going to finish very soon with this idea, not just because it's, uh, it's something that is going to help us as Cubans, but it's something that is going to help us as Democrats. It's something that is going to help us as a region. This map that is there is set by Canada and a few, a few others. The rest of the red countries are also part of something that Gloria is going to introduce you, and it's the photo of Sao Paulo, which is the way in which regimes, after the Cuban regimes, found in order to spread these non-democratic thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. And now, Gloria, please. Of all the countries in Latin America want to emulate Cuba because, of course, everything is free over there. <laughs> what do you care if you cannot leave the island if they give you free education and free health care? That's the thing. And because of that, when Fidel Castro and Che Guevara take possession of the island, the rest of the countries are starting making Marxist guerrillas. Guerrillas that lasted, for example, in my country, Guatemala, for 36 years because they wanted to emulate what was going on in the island. It was the model to follow. And don't get me wrong, this has its basis. If you read a book called Why Nations Fail from Asimoglu and Robinson, you'll find out that in difference from the United States, in Latin America, there was no private property uh, owned, except like, for example, when John Smith came to the New World and he wanted to, you know, have a meeting with Pocahontas' father, Pocahontas' father said, no way. In Latin America, Hernán Cortés, Francisco Pizarro, Pedro Alvarado, they killed off all the Aztecs, all the Incas, and they submitted them. And private property was not the thing. Everything that was condemned was condemned in the name of the king. That was a main difference, because when in this country, when in the United States, the King of England wanted to do whatever he wanted, owners said, no, 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 my friend, here we agree on things. In Latin America, no. In Latin America, everything was owned by the king, and sadly, we haven't caught that vicious circle. So the reason why Cuba and this a model that failed, of course, in the Soviet Union, is seen as an example, is because we have lived in regimes that have been 
uh, excluded, that, that have excluded the majority of people. Let me put you an example. Guatemala, 40% of people are indigenous. Entering in the 21st century, they were not allowed to own private property just because they were Indian. It's absurd, it's ridiculous, but when you exclude a part of the population with ridiculous laws, like you, don't, you cannot own land because of your skin color, then people are going to get pissed. And when they get pissed, they see things like Cuba as the thing to do, you know? Che Guevara, the revolution, because this is the thing. In Latin America, the young people say, no, Pinochet? No, he was a killer. He is an SOB, but Che Guevara, no, he's okay. It's okay that he killed, because his cause is the cause. So we don't have really clear that life, liberty, and private property, or the pursuit of happiness, as you want to call it, are rights that must be preserved in every single individual. It doesn't matter their ideology. If we would be coherent in our continent, we would condemn Che Guevara as a murderer, as well as Pinochet. Not because one is more sexy than the other. Of course I'm saying Pinochet, right? So, so here's the thing. When Cuba, um, when Cuba happens in 1959, Guatemala, Salvador, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Uruguay, a lot of countries grow up their own guerrillas. Yes? And they wanted to emulate what was going on in Cuba. Guys, there are some seats over here if you want to sit down. So, the Marxist guerrillas start 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and they were actually winning. In some cases, military dictatorships, like for example Pinochet, started to, you know, uh, killing them in abruptly ways, or in, or in Guatemala also the army, and we diminished them. When the Soviet Union collapses in 1989 and the Berlin Wall comes down and Bono starts singing One Love in the middle of both Berlins, we didn't understand in Latin America that communism actually doesn't work. It wasn't enough for us to see that this regime led to a genocide of 80 million Chinese people or that communism already is responsible of all these deaths and lacks of liberty? No. In Latin America, you see, we don't read history. So we don't learn from by other people's mistakes. And we still see Cuba as the example. So what happens? In 1989, the Soviet Union collapses. There's no more money. There is no more money to finance the guerrillas, which, of course, fought with AKs 47s. There is no more money for kidnaps, for extortions, for putting bombs. So the left wing of Latin America is in a really pretty bad uh, position. They are starting to think, how are we going to get in power? There's no more Mama Soviet to give us money, you know, to finance guerrillas, political parties, communist ideas, socialist think tanks. What are we going to do? And then another thing happens. We become democracies. If you watch Latin American history, you're going to see that in the 80s, we all left the military dictatorships and we entered in beautiful democracies where everything was going to be perfect. So if you have now democratic elections and you can actually win by being a communist party, there's no reason to be a guerrilla. There's no reason to use violence, right? So you don't have Mama Soviet for money. You don't have to be violent. Now you're going to have to use a mechanism called democracy. And what's that about? Well, democracy is basically convincing a lot of people that you as the Messiah are going to take them away of poverty, they're going to vote for you, once you're in power, you establish exactly what's going on in Cuba, you get rich, and nothing changes for the country. And they understood it like that. So they took an airplane and they went to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Fidel Castro and Lula da Silva are the like intellectual minds. And they say, well, dude, we have to do something, you know? We're not going to do this by violence anymore. So we have to use democratic elections. So how do we do it? They take a blender, you know, from the kitchen. And in that blender, they put the Communist Manifesto. They put it with the right-wing hate, this hate that uh, Latin Americans bear for Yankees, capitalism, entrepreneurship, private property, individuality, all these things that are not understood but are hated. They uh, spray it a little bit with this uh, 
cacique love that we have, we all, well, even if it's a dictator, a caudillo, a cacique, in Latin America, we love the thing with the Messiah, dude. And they blend it all, you know, they, they do their, their mix, and ta -da, they take out the agenda of the socialism of the 21st century. And it has actually like steps that you can follow, and of course they have been followed. But before I get to that, there's another thing that happens when we become democracies and Bono singes one love and the Soviet Union comes down. There were democratic elections and we elected right-wing politicians, yes? Salinas de Gortari in Mexico, Carlos Menem in Argentina, Vinicio Cerezo in Guatemala. We all had our right-wing dude. They take another airplane and they come to this beautiful city, Washington DC. And they swear that they're gonna liberate the markets of Latin America. Free market for everyone, capitalism has won. Let's remember, it was the time that even Francis Fukuyama said, it's the end of history, guys. Capitalism won. Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, they were the kids of the hood. Everything was gonna be amazing. Capitalism for everyone, free market, yeah. So they swear that they're gonna free markets in Latin America because we have been going through a thing called the import substitution, it was a mess, you know, like the, the, the idea behind was let's put walls in between us because we are all enemies, we all are agricultural countries, and it was a disaster. So now these new presidents swear that they're going to liberate our markets and they go back to Latin America and they privatize everything, airlines, cell phone companies, mailing companies, mines, whatever, hydroelectrics, whatever it is, they privatize it. Did they liberate it? Of course not. They gave it in oligopolies and monopolies to their friends, their dudes, their bros, you know, people from the party, people from school. So then again, in Latin America, you have mercantilism. But these guys, left-wing guys, are so bright. If you ask any dude in Latin America what went wrong, is capitalism. Neoliberalism doesn't work, you see? Only the rich get richer, we get poorer. So in 1998, Hugo Chavez rises up already with the agenda, and he says, you saw? Capitalism didn't work. The thing here is the socialism of the 21st century. And people said, okay, let's go for that. And in democratic elections, Hugo Chavez wins. And then, of course, Fidel Castro must have been so happy in, in Havana, Cuba, saying, thank God, man, I was going to die. And not leaving like, someone to continue with the misery and the poverty and the communism. So he gives Hugo Chavez in like the Communist Olympics the torch so he can pass it around. And then you can see Ecuador with Rafael Correa, Bolivia with Evo Morales, Argentina with Nestor Kirchner and Cristina Kirchner, Brazil with Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff, Nicaragua with Daniel Ortega, Mexico, Manuel López Obrador, Guatemala, Manuel Valdizón, etc., etc., etc. So why are these guys so bad? Why are they so ruined? Well, they start a speech uh, about people and anti-people. Institutions doesn't matter here. It's about hatred. Because a society that hates itself, it's a society that doesn't cooperate anymore. And then they be believe in the leader, in the Messiah. So you have people and you have anti-people, yeah? In Spain, Pablo Iglesias calls it la casta. In Argentina, it's the gorillas. In Guatemala, it's the oligarquia. In Brazil, it's the cochinas. You have a different word for them. So the people are selfless. The people are honorable. The people are innocent of everything that has happened in the country and they are gifted with an infallible political sense. They never are wrong with the messiah they choose, of course. And then you have anti-people. Anti-people are responsible and guilty of everything that happens in the country, including earthquakes, hurricanes, whatever. You name it, it's the blame of the anti-people. They say that a populist has three enemies. A previous one, the dude from the 90s, the capitalist bastard, the interior one, the oligarchy, the, the bourgeoisie, and the exterior one, the Yankees, of course. And so, with this dichotomy of people and anti-people, I ask myself, this is amazing, but whose people? Where does people live? I would love to go to people's house and knock the door. Hello, is people here? And the people will come out, you know? Handsome, pluricultural, multi-ethnic. <laughs> 
great dude. And I would say, people, damn people, I'm so confused. People, everyone speaks on behalf of you. Mao Zedong spoke on their behalf, Hitler spoke on their behalf, Hugo Chavez, Fidel Castro, Maduro, Evo Morales. Everyone speaks on your behalf, people. And the worst of it is that every single one of them say that you want a different thing rather than the other. So what's your real deal, people? What is it that you want? But right, you cannot do that. People doesn't exist. People don't have, people doesn't have kids. People doesn't suffer. People doesn't uh, feel hunger. You have good intentioned individuals, what we would call the rational selfish person, and you have bastards. It doesn't matter how much money they have. But if we don't start thinking as individuals, then these guys do what George Orwell predicted in Animal Farm. We become sheep controlled by the pigs. And what do the pigs do? Well, this populist handbook. First, they divide society with hate. Then, they eliminate any opposition from the legislative branch. The legislative branch becomes the tool from which they start doing whatever they want with, their, with our institutions. By judges to avoid trials and convictions, increase state employment to guarantee Alex if everyone works for the government, like in the case of Venezuela, one of three people work in the government. Who's gonna rebel if one of three people leave of that? Constitutional reforms to stay in power, setting limits to private property, 10,500 businesses have been expropriated and nationalized in Latin America, in Venezuela since Chavez came into power. Eliminate freedom of press and freedom of speech, that's what, where uh, you're gonna hear about Ecuador, and, and all the individual and his rights, life, liberty, and private property, and the pursuit of happiness in the name of the people. So what you have is, with a republican constitutional law, but a colonial and monarchical administrative law, Latin America snatches with one hand what it promises with the other. Freedom in the surface, but slavery deep down in essence. This is Juan Bautista Alberti. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Javier and Human Rights Foundation for having us here, and it's a pleasure to share this panel with Rosa Maria, Gloria, and Lilian. Talking about Ecuador, authoritarianism has always been the same. There is no greater pleasure for a dictator than to restrict individual freedoms, especially against those who don't like, who don't think, who don't say the things he wants or he likes. In Ecuador, for, from the very day Rafael Correa took office in 2007, he focused on restricting freedom of expression. What was point number seven in Gloria's PowerPoint was Rafael Correa's number one in his PowerPoint. But in his eagerness to silence those who think different, his actions have fallen into ridicule. So ridiculous that even John Oliver dedicated some of his TV shows to make fun of the childish attitude of Rafael Correa, our local dictator, who publicly ordered a persecution to his detractors on social networks. Five minutes are not enough to talk about the situation in my country, however, I will mention some cases that perfectly illustrate my point. In my country, for example, the honor of the president is worth $80 million, and it's punishable with imprisonment. After an opinion published in a newspaper, Correa initiated criminal proceedings against the author of the article and the owners of the newspaper, requesting $80 million for damaging his honor. In a process that barely lasted a year, when in Ecuador a process like this takes like five or six years, the judges gave reason to Correa, and they said that his honor was not $80 million, that his honor is worth only $40 million. Finally, the dictator, in the exercise of his kindness, decided to pardon the criminals. <laughs> Something similar happens, for example, when a citizen reports a corruption case. Journalists who have denounced corruption from the president's brother, who had contracts with the government for more than $700 million, 
were sued by the president and were sentenced to pay two million dollars compensation for having caused him and a spiritual harm. Oh. Citizens who activate mechanism of citizen oversight in the country regarding public works are usually put on trial for disrespecting the authority. Even a few weeks ago, for example, a young activist was sentenced to prison for denouncing nepotism of a minister of state through his Twitter account. And a councilwoman was also sentenced to prison for denouncing corruption of a mayor. In conclusion, the authorities, instead of investigating corrupts, punish citizens who dare to denounce them. In my country, there's an activist sentenced to prison for clapping. In September 2010, there were some police protests in the country, and the government ordered, officially ordered, that no TV channel could broadcast any news on its own but only reporting what the government said through the official channel. A group of citizens protested and walked into the TV station to demand freedom of expression. There is an image that was in the TV where this activist claps. He has been sentenced to a year and a half in prison as an accomplice in an attempted terrorist act because his applause, with his applause, he was encouraging the terrorists, the protesters. Since 2013, Ecuador has a communications law as well that basically controls the information, contents of media, and the opinion of citizens. There are more than 200 sanctions against citizens, journalists, and media applying this law. Perhaps, the most striking case, the obligation to rectify a cartoon that didn't show the reality of the facts. A cartoon. But the newspaper that published the cartoon received a $350,000 fine for failing to censor the cartoon. And finally, as if the ridiculous was not enough, the image of our president is protected by copyright. <laughs> <laughs> Journalists and media are being reported, that happened to my NGO, as you know, are being reported here in the US applying the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyrights Act, for using his image without permission. Photos of public events, photos of official trips, paid with our money, from our taxes, are now protected by copyright. <laughs> but there are, these are only a few cases of more than 1,200 cases that my organization has reported since 2007. A situation worse than Venezuela? Maybe. But the bad thing is that while there is no bloodshed, my government will not be considered a dictatorship and will not arouse sufficient interest of the international community. We must consider that any president who violates individual freedoms must be considered yes. a dictator. Yes. I want to say that it's a great honor for me to be able to speak to you today. I wish to thank the Marine Foundation for the invitation which me to speak to you about fighting Latin Americans and Stroman legacy. In this sense, the most famous Latin American strongman after Fidel Castro was Hugo Chavez Frias. And as we know, thanks to his legacy, we have in Venezuela an economic crisis in quantity violence, and a very weak democracy. Thanks to this, about a million and a half people have gone to other countries in the last 16 years. However, the consequence of this government, we all know. So at this moment, I prefer not to develop that. 
What I want to know and reflect is, is, is the reason why these leaders have been support in Latin America? And the reason is that we are afraid of liberty. In this sense, socialism has been sold as the only solution. So we love the redistribution and nationalizations. But what, why socialism has been received so well in Latin America? This, this is motivated by this, because it has developed, develop, developed the idea that our failure is a situation created by the capitalist countries. And who was the man who originally raised this argument? Lenin. Yes, Lenin. Because he realized that the capitalist countries were not falling as at his Marx predicted. So Lenin said that capitalism grows when it subtracts money from other countries. This argument makes us think that countries like the US, your country, and Europe are the ones who cause our failure in Latin America. Based on this, um, the only way we can grow is by rejecting the capitalist system of these societies. There is rejecting the respect of, pr of private property and liberty. And who can be the fighter against these capitalists? Well, the Robin Hood, the military wise, the good revolutionary, and the strong man. Based on this, uh, what you what you think Latin American person? Well, on the one hand, the Latin American people knows that capitalism has been successful, but in the other hand, they act the intellectuals and are saying that capitalism will not be successful for him, for us. In basic, in basic fact, Latin Americans should consider these four tips. First one, the Latin American strong man will steal, and the system that generates more misery is the socialist. Two, the fact that the United States is an empire is not motiva motivated by their relationship, relationship with us. Unlike us, the United States defend freedom as a key to progress and create a country for working people and not for their benefit of the, of the strong man. Third, Latin America is not a region of beauty thanks to its roots. By contrast, Latin Americans are like everyone else. We are people with flaws and we can corrupt the system. For and finally, is we insist on seeking the revolutionary fighters against empires, we will be giving the best scenario for a person to use his position for a personal interest, which is to stay in power. So, why do I say this? Because in Venezuela, we have fallen into a socialist system for fear that an advanced society will steal our resources. We say in Venezuela, we have oil, oil has to stay here, but for shame, without thought, we legitimize a system that completely violates private property, which is the most important right in my personal opinion. Why? Because it is the one that allow, allows citizens achieve their life plan while working for it. So, if oil belongs to the state, who really has the title of that resource? For shame, Venezuelans believe to have, to have it because some guys say it belongs to the people, but it's not. The title is being controlled by a group that governs us and use it to its greatest discretion and that situation really can destroy the separation of power and democracy. How you say that, how you say this, how do you think this will not generate in dictatorships? This is the case of Venezuela which today have dozens of political prisoners and government that doesn't want to live even though the majority of the country wants them opposite. In this sense, what I most want to make clear here is that without private property and liberty, there is no civilization and no peace. This is why Cuba and Venezuela are currently showing 
Uh, well, history can put other countries as, as an example, like Germany or Korea. Now, I say this not only because I read this book, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, which, which I love. It is called The Buen Salvaje El Buen Revolucionario, writing by Carlos Rangel, a Venezuelan guy. I recommend it. Two but I say, yeah, two. This is you. So, um, but I say this because I live socialism. I think the system empowers only a few at expense of freedom and dreams of others. So, it is truly evil system, and we have to report it every day because people love, love it easily. In conclusion, I just want to make clear that the best way to empower the individual entrepreneur with goals and dreams are in a system we're all free. So what's, what has to Latin America do for not fall into this showman's power? They need to stop believing in our realities. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you, member of the panel. Uh, so all of all of the panelists here, I just you know, fi are fighting actively the strongman legacy in Latin America. They're fight fighting authoritarianism. Uh, all of them. I want to make start the Q and A Q &A by making a question for all of you to ask to to answer in a maximum of thirty seconds. The question is: There are a couple of schools of thought in the U.S. on what should be the position of the United States, both the, its people, the pueblo, its people and, and its government, and its government, regarding, I know I'm afraid to use the word people too much, but the people and, and its government uh, should have regarding Latin America. A couple of schools of thought, libertarians, Trump, all libertarians are in favor, for example, of no, you know, almost shutting down all U.S. embassies, not shutting down the embassies, but just like doing consular services for American citizens, period. No intervention in internal politics, no aiding opposition groups, etc., etc., because that theory goes, can backfire, and part of the examples that are given for that is are to basically blame the U.S. for all the things that went wrong in Latin America, including right wing dictatorships from Pinochet, Videla. I'm not so sure about that, but that's part of the, it's a school of thought. And the other one is to continue to intervene actively through USA, through the International Republican Institute, through the National Democratic Institute, providing funding for opposition groups whenever there are authoritarian governments in place. What would be your answer here for this very smart group of young students here in 30 seconds each of you of what the U.S. should do? Start with Gloria. The U.S. first has to realize that they are uh, drifting from the principles that made this country great and that you're actually going in the top of this country. So the thing is that if the U.S. is not here and you have millennials supporting socialism, what you're going to have is a very confused United States changing policies every five years. Since you guys had 9-11, Latin America was never again your priority. So what you do also reflects the confusion you have here. So if you guys don't realize if you want socialism or not in your country, you only harm us with any aid that you give us. Thank you, Mauricio. 30 seconds, I really don't care about what governments say because they care more on diplomacy and commercial interests rather than individual freedoms. I care about what you know, what people know about the situation in our countries and what you can do to support our cause. Promoting the values you believe in because those values are important for us as well. So the main thing is take care of our countries as well. It's not just a matter of the U.S., of, our, of your daily lives, but also from Latin America and what we are suffering lately. Thank you, Mauricio. Rosa Maria. I think that the word is coherency. It's to do what they say they are engaged with. And in, in that sense, it's, it's, it's not a call just for the government, it's not a, a call just for the administration, it's also a call for the citizenry not the people, but each citizen engaged with, with the idea of promoting not uh, the values, but also with the idea of promote all that you want for yourself, also for the others, also for Latin Americans, also for Cuba. And finally, is to change the reference. 
the reference for the administration and the reference for many in Latin America and even in some, sometimes the reference to us is the power, is the powerful. They are the, our unique interlocutors. It's a call to change that, to put the power where the power should be, which is in the citizenry, and to put also the world and to talk with the ones which are not in the power, that Basta have called the powerless, but are the ones that should be in control. Thank you. Thank you, Rosmaria. Lilian. Puedo decir mi respuesta en español porque no sé muy bien inglés. Well, most people speak Spanish here, though, right? No. They know Che Guevara. You can translate it. Bueno, lo primero que quiero decir es pedir disculpas porque yo creo que este país ha recibido muchos insultos de parte de Latinoamérica y sobre todo de Venezuela. First, I want to say sorry because I think this country has received too many insults from Latin America and from Venezuela, especially. De hecho, si llegan a ir alguna vez a Venezuela, yo creo que van a encontrar muchas paredes rayadas con mensajes de gringos, váyanse de aquí, eso es muy normal. In fact, if you go to Venezuela or anyone here has gone to Venezuela, they've seen many walls there uh, sprayed with gringos go home and that type of messages. So she wants to apologize for it. The U.S. is not to blame for Latin America's failures and for Latin America's failures, but the failure of Latin America is because of the ideas, the wrong ideas that we've chosen. Y esto, lo, lo que yo les pido a ustedes es que sigan primero promoviendo eh, las ideas que, que los han llevado a ustedes al crecimiento. All I, all I ask you is to continue pushing the ideas that have le led you to development, to growth. Sí, y, y que no caigan en los populismos. O sea, yo, yo, And not to fall on populism. Sí, porque yo ahorita estoy viendo que en, ahorita en la campaña presidencial. Es lo que estoy viendo through the presidential elections. Sí, sí están teniendo protagonismo dos candidatos que la verdad es que no tienen un buen discurso. So the two candidates that have getting have been getting the most publicity and success yeah. are are two populists. Yeah. Y, y yo creo que eso no debería estar pasando en este país que yo sabía en mi opinión eh, Estados Unidos es uno de los países más importantes del mundo y es el que ha mantenido la estabilidad. This should be happening in, in a country so great like the U.S. that has that is the most important in the world and that has that his role is, is huge for world stability. So, that's all. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. One question for, from the public, because we were already on time. He was raising his hand at the beginning, so one question. Sorry about, the, we're going to be available for off-camera and off-time uh, questions. But yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Guillermo Panel, Gloria, it's good to see you. Everybody, thank you so much. Mauricio, I'm from Guayaquil, so it's good to see you. Great. Um, I have a question. I'm, I'm here, I, I grew up here in the United States, and the title of this, of this panel is a little bit misleading, I think, and it's a little bit uh, disconcerting because I agree, we, 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 we do fall into strongman uh, rhetoric and we do have populism, but the left is very good at changing our words. And yes. so when we start discounting the policies in Chile that, that Pinochet's government put into place, the minute we say everything that Pinochet was a strongman, he was wrong, they're going to say immediately, exactly, you're right, change the constitution, get rid of all the reforms, get rid of the free market. So how do we go about making sure that we, we attack strongmen in Latin America and get rid of populism by still defending the positive reforms that the right has been able to implement in Latin America? Well, first of all, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Pinochet didn't respect life from people who were communists. So what really angers these left-wing people is that Pinochet was a killer. So what you have to say as a libertarian is, yeah, you don't have to implement free market and also kill people. Why not having a leader that can respect life, liberty, and private property, the three of, of them? But Pinochet was not a reference from that. So what I always say is, yeah, okay, he killed a lot of people, but let's see his economic policies. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming. A big round of applause.